Uh, thank you, everybody. So welcome this afternoon to my SQL talk. You won't believe it's SQL. Who's using SQL? Ah, who likes using SQL? Ah, ah let's see. Um, I would like to tell you something you might not know about SQL. And when I say SQL, I might mean actually the, um, the real standard. So there's a standard behind it. It's an ISO standard. 9075 is the number in case you ever um, want to look at it. And believe it or not, there was a big break by, by 99 where the concept of SQL has fundamentally changed and barely anyone noticed. And today I would like to show you these this fundamental changes and how they are employed by the, by the database vendors. So before I can show you um, how something changed, we need to have a common understanding how it was before. So I would like to, to establish some common grounds. For that, I need to go a little bit back in time but not as far as 74. We can immediately start with uh, 92, because who knows SQL 92? Yeah, at least some. So this is one of the common things. So if you have learned SQL at university or so, what you have learned there is probably SQL 92. So what was the key idea behind there? There was this relational thing. So everybody knows this relational database name, I guess. Everybody knows what that means. But unfortunately, you're still wrong. You're, you're misunderstanding. You're, you're not really understanding how the relational model is defined today. And this is the big um, uh, change which I would like to describe. So SQL 92 was, was strictly tied to the relational idea. And the relational idea has two components there. On the one hand, we have the relational data model. And one thing of this relational data model was that we should use something which they referred to as com uh, atomic types. Um, when we, when we um, decide what we can put into single cells. So if you look at the intersection between a column and a row at a cell, what can you put in there? And in the original definition, um, they said, okay, atomic values. So here you have one. And out of these, we can make up these relations or tables, as we say in SQL. So we can um, use those to fill them in there. And as you see there already, uh, SQL made already some exceptions from the strictly scientific definition because it allows for the null value, for missing values. Okay? Nevertheless, so this was the atomic type idea. And another important idea there at that time, and this is still valid today, is that the schema, the persistent schema in which you store your data, this should be independent of what you do with that data or where this data is coming from. This is also related to normalization, but really um, forget about all these layers of normalization. I will come back to them. It's really about how can we store data persistently so that we can use that data no matter what we want to do with that data. So design the schema in such a way that it is a good fit for the data itself, not for the processing, because this is what will last forever. And the requirements of what we want to do with that data, those changes all the time. We don't even know what we plan to do with the data which we are kind of collecting now. So we cannot um, make a, a right um, choose on how to, how to store it for future requirements which we cannot know yet. So we just store it so that the data itself feels comfortable in the schema. Um, and when we come to this normalization, um, you know that quite often we split some data across different tables. Even um, if one single business case is affected, we still store it in multiple tables. And that's kind of, yeah, inconvenient, let's put it that way. And that's the reason why we have the second side of this relational idea. Because the relational idea is not, about, not, not only about the data model, it's only about making these transformations more easy. You see, on the left-hand side, I have the normalized, persisted um, data model. But sometimes you need um, another form of data for some processing. And then you would like to have a language which makes it easy to transform it from the persisted shape into something that is more convenient to process for each individual processing requirement. And as we know, we have many different processing requirements in a single application. That's the reason why we want to do that on the fly and not tailor the persisted data model to one of these requirements, and some of them we don't even know yet. So this is the other side of the relational idea. This is a language which allows transformations done on the fly in a powerful and easy way. 
And at that time, SQL 92, it was mostly about joining. Who knows joins? Yeah, everybody, yeah, of course. And then there was the Big Bang, the year 99, when the next standard release um, came out. And it was really a Big Bang. I will just give you a quote from a paper that was published at that time. Great news! The relational data model is dead. I mean, you could take this nowadays as a clickbait title. Isn't it true? Nobody likes the relational data model. So um, I like this paper very much because it, it makes some interesting points. And before going into the details, I would like to show you two um, quotes out of that, which give you a first impression. The first one is, to say these SQL 99 extensions are more extended interpretations of the relational data model, so there is something they refer to as extended interpretation of the relational data model. It's like saying that an intercontinental ballistic missile is merely an extended interpretation of a spear. Okay, so there is something which is still similar because it's an extended interpretation, yet it is entirely different because you see a, a spear and a missile is, is something quite different. And the second quote I would like to give you here is, um, with SQL 99 you can get the best of both worlds, and you can get the worst of both worlds. It's up to the database practitioners, and that's us, to do the right thing. It's just a toolbox. There are now two different ways, or even more different ways, to do stuff, and there is no single right way. It's upon us to change for each problem we have the best fit. So after these two quotes to give you a, a rough idea what's coming up, let's, let's have a look into these details. What, what has so fundamentally changed that they say, okay, now it's an intercontinental ballistic missile? So on the one hand, we have this relational data model. And uh, I would like to, to quote Chris Date for that, although many others contributed to that finding as well, but he wrote books, so it's easy to quote. And what he wrote there is, I was as confused as anyone else. But the question remains, what was he confused about? And he was confused about the atom. What is it? What is the atom? What is that thing which we are supposed to put into the cells of these tables? Because people were coming up and were saying, okay, yes, I know, for example, a character string is an atom. But, you know, the word atom means cannot be split. And a character string, yeah, you can split it into its characters. It's a bad word to describe what you mean. Can we go and search for a better word? And people were, were looking around that. They are just searching for, for more useful definitions. So if you were watching the news like last week, um, last week we have ju just got a new definition of the kilogram. Have you noticed? Anyone noticed? Yeah. So there is now a stronger definition of the kilogram. It's not the one piece of, of metal in Paris anymore. Now there is a more scientific, more, more stressable um, definition. And in the same idea, they would like to say, okay, we would like to have the right word there. We know what is meant, but we also know that this word is the wrong one. Because if we would really follow up that idea of atomic, then, I mean, the only atom of information, it's the bit. And apparently, it's not meant that we can only bit, put a single bit in each cell. So this is clearly not what was meant. So he wrote on and said, by the early 90s, however, I'd seen the light. And in, in his own words, domains can contain anything, he wrote there. And it, that just means, um, domains means just the types can be anything. Really anything. And that was a quite interesting finding, because this is about the, the first normal form. Do you know how many normal forms we have? Yeah, seven, eight. So there are six numbered, and then there are a few more which don't even have numbers, they have names. So it's really like, eh? But the foundation is really the first normal form. This is where this, this word was used, this atomic types. And in the meanwhile, they have stacked over all these normal forms up to the sixth one on the basis of the first one. And then the guys were coming, hey, look, the first definition, it's wrong at the base. And they were saying, oh, shit. <laughs> and then he was going, no problem. We just cross out that single word atom and everything will be fine. And I, I picture it like there was a Jenga tower of this normalization 
things, you know, all these layers of normalization. And he was basically replacing the lowest level and swapping them and putting another definition in there. And everybody would know it will crash, it will crash. But nothing happened. It turns out that all the other definitions of the relational data model of the normalization levels, they don't need this atomic thingy there. They still work no matter what you put in there. And that was a quite interesting finding, and it was taken up by the SQL standard in the year 99. So SQL introduced rich data types. They were previously strictly forbidden. Have you ever heard something like no repeating groups? Raise your hand. That was teached somewhere, sometime, for very long. You should have only one value there. That's gone for 20 years now. So we can still use those atomic types. And of course, they are still useful in many, many cases, no question. But SQL also introduced arrays. Why not? Everything can be in there. So take arrays, why not? And nested tables. That's kind of scary. You can have an entire table in a single cell. It's okay, go ahead. It doesn't break anything. It's not invalid SQL, it doesn't break normalization, it is, does not break the, the relational data model, it's fine. And more useful probably is um, composite types, like monetary values. If you want to store monetary values, you might want to combine the numeric part of it and the currency part of it into a single type, and then you can have a column of that type, and if you later on do the transformation steps, you will even enjoy the type safety of SQL. So all of that was introduced with SQL 99 into the international ISO standard. But that was only the data model side. On the other hand, we still have the transformation side. That was originally mostly focused on relational algebra, but that's gone. I mean, it's still there, but it's not a limit anymore. We now have more powerful transformation steps. And with SQL 99, the recursive query was introduced. Who knows that? Recursion in SQL. Okay, who is afraid of it? Ah, yeah, more, more, more. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I will just show you the example, okay? Think of a hierarchy. You might have seen that. Where you have a table, where you basically have the parent pointer. So each of these blocks is a row in that table, and it has a pointer to its parent. And then you might have questions like, okay, if I start with that one, because let's say I know the ID of that one, like 42, um, how can I find all those that are below that? Let's try that with good old SQL 92, with the purely relational thinking. So if we know the ID, we just take the ID, and we have it. So now, how to proceed? And at that time, we already have had the union all operation, where we combine the result of two queries into one query with one result. And if we put in the very same idea here into the where clause of the second query, where we look on the parent relation, then we will immediately hit the next layer, those items which refer to that starting point, 42. So far, so good. But how to proceed? Game over. When it comes to SQL 92, there is no simple solution. We could, of course, uh, continue with union all, that's easy. But the data model doesn't have the grandparent pointer, and we really want to, don't want to introduce such a thing. So, really not. So, the solution we have nowadays is basically that we can express a query that processes its own output again. Because if I take the ID which I get out of the first query and put it in as the search term for the next query, then I will find the nodes on the next level. That's just what I did there manually. We just have to make it somehow work automatically. And now, watch. The syntax is just about four lines for that. We need this with recursive at the top. There's a main query at the end, it's basically a statement scoped view, but the syntax is really not important here. What is important is that we have a self-reference. We are now able to search based on the result of our very own query. It's an indirect self-reference, but we still refer to the output of our own query. And that makes it possible that we hit all of these nodes in one go, and we will get out one out of uh, each of them out of the query in its own row. 
And that's now in the international ISO standard since 99. So that's 20 years. But yeah, a standard is just a piece of paper, more precisely a PDF download. Um, what about the database vendors? This is even an optional feature. They are not enforced to implement it. But nowadays, pretty much every database vendor, at least the major ones, they support this operation. So you can basically copy and paste the previous query, put it in all to these databases, and it will just work. You don't have any ping pong between your client application and the database to fetch each um, one individually. You get all of them in one go. So this was just one feature I have picked out of the SQL 99 standard, and I would like to skip over to the next one because there are also exciting news in there. So the next one was then 2003. Not so long, not so much later. And one of the things that happened there, you see it here, XML. Who's using XML? Uh -huh. just, just for my interest, who's using JSON? Uh -huh. Much more. Yeah, OK. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Um, at that time, we are now in the year 2003, there was no JSON, basically. Okay? So XML was OK at that time. Um, so what SQL 2003 introduced, two big things. The one is the schema-less idea. Who knows the buzzword schema-less? Yeah, MongoDB and all of that. Yeah, you know that. Yeah. Um, we have that in SQL for like 15 years. Um, yeah, it's the way it is. Um, so the first way um, schema-less was introduced into SQL was with XML, because that was the thing at the time. Um, I won't go into the details there, because then later on, we have also got JSON support in SQL. And this is something I will show you a little bit later. So let's start with the right-hand side, with the transformation capabilities. There we got something called analytic functions, or more precisely, window functions. Who knows that window function thingy in SQL? Oh, come on. OK, so few. OK, so you are right here. Just stay tuned. Um, window functions, they are really, really, really important. If you don't know window functions, then you basically don't know SQL. Really. If you didn't raise your hand right now, you have just lost the ability to claim knowing SQL. Cross it out of your CV. <laughs> I'm sorry. On the other hand, you can edit just in a few minutes because I explain it to you. <laughs> um, yeah, later on, that feature was um, extended as well. But also, look who else introduced that besides the classical SQL vendors. Google BigQuery, for example, quite, quite early, 2013, and so on. So many, many of the new um, systems also have this functionality. Learning that really pays off. This is the message I want to give you here. So here's an example. I have a query on the one hand, and the result it returns. So just two columns at a time. And what I would like to do is I would like to add another column where I basically have the balance, because when each of these rows is, let's say, a transaction, where I put some money in and maybe take some money out, then I would like to have another column which tells me at that transaction, after that transaction, the balance was like this. So after the first transaction, if I put in 10 on an empty account, basically, then I have 10. And if I then put in another 20, I will end up with 30. If I take out 10, then I will have 20, and so on. So this is the question how to implement that. And that was also possible in SQL 92. It was just ugly. On the one way or the other, you needed a self-join. Do you know what a self-join is? Who knows that? OK. Who is using self-joins? Uh-huh. Ah, some, some shy hands, I see. I can just tell you one thing. Self-joins are really a thing of the past. Self-joins were OK in SQL 92, because this was the relational cage it was just captured in. It could not use anything non-relational. So self-joins at that time were OK. Nowadays, I would say 95% of the self-joins I see in code bases, they are wrong nowadays. There are better solutions to that. And this is one of them. Window functions is one of the important features to avoid self-joins. So what is it about? We would basically, what we really need to do there is to use an aggregate function, sum here in this case because we would like to summarize some values, some transactions. But you know, um, in SQL 92, if you're using aggregate functions, you had to use the group by clause. There was just no exception. 
Um, now, there is uh, an alternative. Instead of using group by, which has the, the, has the, the um, property of, of putting rows together, merging rows, we can now, instead of group by, use the over clause right after the aggregate function to specify over which rows we would like to apply the aggregate. You see, it's already in the word. Over which rows should I now run this um, aggregate function? And inside this over clause, we can then specify and we can describe the rows we would like to build the aggregate upon. And it starts quite strangely with order by. And order by, uh, when, I, when I learned these window functions, I was really confused. Why should I possibly want to order something which I'm just adding up? Like the last time I checked, one plus two and two plus one you know, was, was close enough for my use case. Um, so why would I like to order there? And indeed, it's not about that. It's about something different. Because SQL is a declarative programming language. We need to declare how, how those rows, uh, which rows we would like to aggregate upon. And in the next step, you see there's still a gap in there. In the next step, we will then use words like before that or after that. And of course, before and after only makes sense if we have a, a definite, definite, uh, defined um, sort order. So that's why we put in the order by clause here, so that the database and me has the same idea when I say before and after. And once we have established this common idea, which is basically chronological in that case, then I can say things like, I would like to build the sum over all rows between unbounded preceding, that means the very first row, and the current row. And now we are done. Now we are done. Um, so this is a so what, what we call framing in SQL. So we, we are specifying really over which rows should we put the aggregate. And when the database now runs that query, and while it is at the first row, it will say, OK, I now have to find the rows between unbounded preceding. That's the first one. And the current row, that's also the first one. So that frame, that between clause, captures exactly one row. And that will then be summarized, and you get the result 10. But as soon as the database is at the second row, the unbounded preceding means still at the very top. But the current row is now the second one. So now it will cover two rows so that you get the total of these two rows, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this is really just one example of window functions and how you can use them. You can do really fancy stuff with that. For example, you could say rows between three preceding and three following, and it means exactly that. So for a moving average, for example, you can do really, really fancy stuff in there quite easily. And that was introduced into the International Standard 2003. And can you use it in your database now? Probably yes. Who is using a database which is not in this picture? Ah, what is it? Mongo? I mean an SQL database which is not in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. It's your fault. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is window functions. And I've really just shown you one example. And think, uh, remember that all these, these fresh windows, like BigQuery and NuoDB and whatever, um, they support that as well, because it's really so immensely helpful. It's one of the important ways to avoid self-joins. And as I like to say, if you're using self-joins, I mean, you're, you're really using SQL 92. And it's basically like all employees must wash hands after using self-joins. You, <laughs> you should really feel dirty. I mean, sometimes it's OK, it's the best solution, but it's really like only in 5% of the cases. So better wash your hands when you did it. So going on, time flies. I skip over to the year 2016, when we have got the current standard. So now you know the current standard is from 2016. A new one is already worked upon. There are rumors that the target date is 2020. So that's basically next year. And there are more ru rumors that graph processing might have been one of the features they're working on. 
but these are just rumors. You don't have them from me. Have you switched off the camera? Yeah. Um, okay, let's look what's, what's in there. I told you before, JSON. Who likes JSON? Who, okay, who uses JSON? Ah, uh, many more, I see. Uh, um, so I'll give you an example. Um, you, could, you could store JSON documents in SQL databases basically forever, because it's just a character string. Okay, uh, that was always possible. Make a CLOP and, and go away. But now, um, the database has some understanding of what these things mean. What does this, this, this bracket here mean? What, that, what does this curly bracket mean? And the colon and the quotes, how does all of this work? We can now f ask questions like, is this a JSON document? which is stored in the string column. We can ask, okay, if it is a JSON document, um, what type is it? Ah, an array, thank you. And if it is an array, we can of course also ask um, how many elements does it have? And then we will get two here in this example. So the database has now, SQL, has now a semantic understanding of the JSON document structure. And it provides a lot of functionality, not only to access JSON documents, but to transform. Remember, transformation is one of the really important things why we have SQL in the first place, to transform between some persisted data structure, which will not change no matter how the, the requirements change, and whatever is convenient for your program right now to process. So one of these transformation steps which we have now in SQL is the transformation from a JSON document into something yeah, yeah, more, let's say, atomic <laughs> table design, um, and vice versa, of course, but this is the thing I would like to show you. And that's the entire query. I'll go through it slowly. It starts with the question mark. What's the question mark? Who does not know what the question mark is in SQL? Oh my God. <laughs> it's the thing that prevents SQL injection. <laughs> who, who does not know what SQL injection is? Oh my God. You're kidding. Uh, so one is, uh, usually one is kidding. So um, of course, <laughs> that's at least what I hope. Um, so if you pass data to a database, to an SQL database, um, you should usually not write the values into the uh, query string itself because that's insecure and slow and blah, 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 blah. Um, it, it would be really awkward to just put in the, the entire JSON document in there. So instead, we're using um, placeholders and then have a different API where we can say, okay, the value for this placeholder is that string, and then it's easier, faster, and most importantly, more secure. So this question mark is basically, um, yeah, it's the document, the JSON document I have there. And then we have um, a new language, the so-called SQL JSON pass language. And its function is quite similar to uh, XPath for XML. So who knows XPath for XML? Yeah, most of you. And if you don't, like in HTML and CSS, we have the CSS selectors. They also serve the same purpose, to describe, to pick out one or more elements out of a document, to describe which elements are meant. And now we have in SQL also a, a language like that for JSON. And if you look there, it basically says dollar, which is the root node. Then it says, okay, I'm expecting an array, and I would like to have all elements from this array. This is what the asterisk says. So this is now this language. And you will see um, in this example, it hits two, two objects. And that means the result of this JSON table function, that's the name of this new function, the result of that will have two rows. Because what, what, whatever you hit with this um, pass expression will then be turned into rows. And yeah, well, SQL is mostly about declaring tables, so like declaring the columns and declaring the rows. We have now just declared the rows, so what's left is declaring the columns, and you see there is a clause for that. And you see uh, column names, you see column types, and then, of course, you use this, pa uh, this path language again to describe um, where to get the values from. And that's it. Is that easy? Ah, come on. Is that useful? <laughs> uh, um, not yet, I would say. Because look what I'm doing here. Basically, I say select star, so I'm getting back something to the client, and I'm processing input from the client, so I'm sending something to the database, transforming, getting it back to the client. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
But I'm just showing you um, that example because it's so easy. You still have all the power of SQL because you can combine insert with select. That means you can quite easily insert this result into a table directly in one go. So you have basically one statement that you execute. You pass it a JSON document. The database will transform it into rows and columns and then load it automatically into a table. Does it now look a little bit more useful? Hmm? Yeah, thank you. So, of course, the standard has all the other transformation steps as well, from the, from the more atomic design to JSON documents, it's all there. But this one is probably um, one of the more useful ones and more easy ones to describe. So can you use that in your databases yet? That was introduced with 2016, with the SQL standard 2016. So yeah, uh, yeah, maybe in this room, quite a lot of people, I guess. Who is using a database that already supports it according to this? So Oracle or MySQL, basically, who is using either Oracle or MySQL? Is this a Java conference here? <laughs> what else are you using? <laughs> SQL Server. Yeah, it's yellow because they don't support this function, but they have something similar. It's called um, open, open JSON. Here we have it. OK. Um, yeah, Postgres, anybody? They are just working on that. That's what I know. So there will be something in Postgres 12, but not that particular function. But they are working on it. OK, so this was um, a little bit a teaser of what SQL can do with JSON nowadays. So let's go uh, over to the next um, feature. And I must say, this is my favorite feature from the past decade, basically, from this decade. Um, match recognize. Has anybody ever heard of that? Match recognize. One. OK, one. OK, let, let's go on. So. It's mostly, of course, it's not limited, but it's mostly useful for time series, processing time series. So I have here, let's say, something like a log file. The time flies here to the right-hand side. And I have some, let's say, hits, if this is a web log or something like that. And I'm using a definition of a session, which is everything that happens you know, when, when between one hit and the next one is less than 30 minutes. So that means in this example, I have uh, four sessions. And when each of these hit is basically a row in the table, then we might have questions like, yeah, well, how many sessions do we have? How long is the average duration of the session? And so on and so on. And how can we do that in SQL? And uh, yeah, there is the easy answer. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> um, it's actually really easy. I will, I will explain it to you. Um, it's just a little bit, a lot of nesting. What it all boils down to is, um, what we are doing here is we, we're basically looking, to, we're checking this condition. If it falls within the 30 minutes interval, then we do something, then one, otherwise um, null, basically. So we are tagging the first hit of each session. You see it also at the top. We are marking them in some way. And then the next step, we are basically doing the same pattern which we did before, the running total. We are summarizing everything that happened till now. You see, here I have the sum with this over order by. This is what I have shown you before. And then we will basically count the number of how many of these markers did we have till now. And then you see that each of the, the hits in the session, they now have something in common. The session ID, basically, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, and so on. And with that, we can do whatever we want. We can do group by and, and everything, basically. So that works quite well. It just needs a little bit of, of nesting. And yeah, the code, it's, it's a lot, yes. Um, therefore, how about using that boy? Who's that boy? A regular expression. Yes. Who knows that boy? Who knows regular expressions? Ah, that's something we can build upon. <laughs> now imagine. Regular expressions, they work on characters, right? So most of the characters in regular expression, they match actually themselves. And then we have a few special characters, like we have it here. The dot is the everything. And the backslash big S is the, the non-white space, OK? And the asterisk is the many times, zero till many times. A few characters have a special meaning, OK? That's regular expressions, how you know it already. Now imagine we could apply that idea 
to match rows in a table. So instead of matching characters, we want to match rows. And that's now possible with SQL. Um, the only difference is basically that we um, have to define our own vocabulary. Because as I said, in, in regular expressions, each character is, is stands for itself. But how could a row basically stand for itself? That's something, a different concept. So what we have in SQL, we have to define our own vocabulary. Therefore, we have a define clause. And what I've done here is say, OK, um, I'm defining a vocabulary, a cont. And any row where this condition is true can, can be referred to as cont. And this is, again, this 30-minute um, condition. And then in the next step, uh, step after defining the vocabulary, I can now use that vocabulary to write a pattern in the pattern clause. There I say any, which means basically match one row, any, any row but one row. That's very much like the dot in regular expressions. And then match as many as you can, as many as you want, of the rows that satisfy this condition. And it will do exactly that. It takes any rows and then runs on as long as it falls into this 30 minute um, limit. And if it stops, then this is one match. And then it will go on to search for the next match. And once we have all these matches, then we can also define what we would like to do with these matches. And then we say again, it's about defining rows again. We define, OK, we would like each match to be turned into a single row. We can also say we would like to keep all the rows, or we can pick some rows which we would like to have in the result. We just define the rows in the result. And the last step is basically defining the columns. Don't ask me why they said measures. It's basically select. You can just now um, define some more columns there. And there you can use words like last and first and so on and just um, do some, some arithmetic here, like the duration, which I can la later on use for the average. So this is really my most favorite feature of SQL in this decade. It's a pretty new one, also introduced with 2016. Until now, it's only supported by Oracle out of these classical database systems. Um, yeah, but I hope we will have that in more databases soon. Who likes this? Uh, who is sleeping? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, um, I have a little bit more for you. Because I'm running out of time, but I don't mind, I just go over. Because I have a time machine. <laughs> and that's a handy thing on stage. Um, so let's go back in time to the year 2011, when another standard was released. And there, indeed, SQL learned time traveling. Um, and there are even two ways to do time, time traveling. Actually, four ways, but yeah, two ways. Let's start that one. There's a so-called application versioning. And that's a means to, to store in a database some, when something happened in the real world. Like if people marry and the name changes, it happens on day of the marriage. But the business partners like telcos, banks, and so on, they learn about this weeks later, after honeymoon and all of that, you know? And the application versioning is meant to, to store when it happened in reality. That means when I learn about it now because I get the letter, I need to have the possibility to say, OK, as of in the past, or even as of in the future. Because fee schedules, for example, we model in the future. We say today, next month, we will charge you more, of course. My favorite example in this um, is actually currently the EU membership table. So there is this Brexit, you might know that. <laughs> uh, and actually, it would be quite easy to model that, um, to say when they are leaving, if we would know the date. <laughs> the technology is really not the problem. It's just the information, the date that is missing. So it works in both directions, either backdated or forward dated. And the application needs to explicitly take care of it. And therefore, we have a lot of new syntax there. But I will skip over that. Instead, I will show you the system versioning. This is almost automatic and transparent to the application. It models when we learned about something. So when we receive the letter of the marriage and that the name has changed, then we learned of, about it now. 
And the nice thing is if we enter it into the, the database now, the database just needs to take the system time and says, okay, as of now, we have learned it. And that can be done automatically. Therefore, there is barely any syntax change and it's mostly transparent to the database. So that means you basically enable it in your database in the backend and that's it. So I'll show you the syntax. It's a decision you take. It's upon us, the database practitioners. Do you remember? So you can decide table by table level. You can either have no versioning at all, like we have now, or you can have application versioning, or system versioning, or even both. But this example is just for system versioning, and it's upon you to decide. And what I have there is, what it requires you is to add two columns which store the date, the validity of each row. When, when did the validity of that row start and when did it end? I said from until here. You can freely choose some, some names in there. But you have to tell the database, listen boy, take care of that. And the way to do it is generated always as row start and as row end. That you put on these columns and then the database will take care of them. Then we also need to combine them into something called a period. You see here, period for system time and from until. Otherwise, those would just be two unrelated columns. And finally, we have to enable the magic with system versioning. And then it happens. If you run an insert, you don't mention these two columns because the database knows it. It's generated always as. And it will automatically propagate 10 o'clock when I run it at 10 o'clock. And it goes on. If I then do an update, the database takes care of it. And I will now have two physically stored rows in this table. Two of them. It's not overwritten. They are still there, and they are marked with the from and till date so that it's clear which row was valid at which time. And of course, if you delete, it's not gone. It's still there. It's just setting the date accordingly. And all of that is fully transparent. You don't need to change your application. And of course, if you run a query after you deleted that row, you will get an empty result. It's transparent. So why should we store it at all? Of course, there's a new syntax where you can now say, OK, I would like to view at that table. This is a table level extension after the table name. For system time, as of that time, I would like to see how this table was looking like, and then you will get the result. So there is a little bit syntax, but only when you want to, to see in the past, basically. So can you use that yet? Um, yes, you see, even MariaDB. Is anyone using MariaDB? Oh, quite a few. You can use. Did you know that? Yes, yes. OK. Then go ahead. Uh, MariaDB is at the moment working on 10.4, and there they are working on the application versioning. So there is something coming there. So who thinks this is a useful feature? Yeah, who, who would have needed that feature in the past already? Yeah. Uh, another question, who is having customers? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, seriously, who is having customers? Uh, not everybody, it's okay. I, mean, <laughs> I don't mind, but seriously, everybody who is having customers needs to be able to reflect name changes and things like that. And we would like to have that in some way which um, is correct that we can still understand that, um, like five years ago, the customer have, has had a different name. So as, uh, my, my statement here is everybody who has customers needs that feature. And yeah, well, if you don't have, then yeah, I don't know. OK, so um, this was the time traveling of SQL. And I would like to come to the end now, because my time machine is actually broken. So uh, I don't get two hours on stage, I think. And I think there is a, a trap door going to opening then. So let's conclude. Really, a lot has happened since SQL 92. Do you see that picture? <laughs> That's a printout of just one part of part number two of the current SQL standard. It has 1,700 pages. If you add the other parts, it has in total 4,000 pages. And yeah, well, I also don't like this kind of benchmarks, like lines of code. What does it say? Okay, but still, it gives you some impression. SQL 92 has had 750 pages. Now we have 4,000, so that's in the ballpark of five times as much. 
And remember that starting from SQL 99, the relational cage, the idea that we are limited to relational data model like we used to know it, or the relational algebra like joins, is gone. 80% of the current standard was done after breaking the relational cage. So really a lot has changed and it's really beyond relational. This is SQL. If somebody is saying, hey, come on, um, this dinosaur da databases, SQL, uh, relational databases, you cannot use that for that use case, then your answer should actually be, it's no problem. We are not using a purely relational database. We are using SQL. That's beyond relational. Really, 80% of SQL has nothing to do with the relational idea. And last but not least, who is using Hibernate or something the like? Oh my god. <laughs> CRUD. Who knows CRUD? Yeah. Create, read, update, and delete. A typical life cycle of something, like a row in a database. It's okay. Use it. But also use the other features, like joins, like window functions, like recursion, if it makes sense. If you're using SQL only to run CRUD statements, insert, update, delete, select, mostly on primary key, then you're not using SQL at all. Really. So really, if you're using only CRUD, then you're definitely doing wrong. And I think yeah, there are some tools which, which encourage that pattern. Finally, how to learn about all of all these new stuff. And here comes my website into the game. ModernSQL.com, who knows that website? Oh, always the same people. So ModernSQL.com, it's uh, one of my websites. Um, I write there, a blog there about all these new features and how the database windows are taking them up or how they are screwing it up. Both of that I'm, I'm blogging about. Um, so I invite you to have a look there and follow there. It's anyway for free, nothing to lose. Also on Twitter you can follow it. You can follow, follow me personally. You can look at wienand.at, so that's my last name, .at, because I'm from Austria, um, about services like training and so on. And then you can just leverage the power of modern SQL, which is really beyond relational. So I'm the SQL Renaissance ambassador. I'm really pushing the SQL renaissance, which is actually happening because all of the no SQL systems now add SQL or some QL interfaces to the products. Have you noted, noticed that trend? Like Elasticsearch is adding SQL. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, maybe, maybe. SQL is coming back. Now is the time to, to look at it. Uh, otherwise, you might lose the, the, the next new big trend. So my name is Markus Wienand. I'm the SQL Renaissance Ambassador. I'm still here for two and a half minutes for questions, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. So do you have any questions? While you're thinking, um, one moment. At the camera operator, there at the, at the podest, basically, there are, I've put some coasters, you know, beer coasters, the thing you put under coasters, take them. There are stickers, take them. There are cards, take them when you leave the room near to the camera operator. So now your question. OK, can we update JSON directly? Can we update JSON directly? Um, no, you can replace it. The reason is because it's immutable. SQL, values in SQL are immutable. Um, so the SQL standard does not provide a function to update one specific element of a bigger JSON element, uh, thing. But what it does provide is to get the element out, then morph it, basically, and write it back. That's the way SQL would approach that. Nevertheless, so the standard does not have such a feature, but um, most vendors, or some vendors at least, offer you such a possibility, even though it breaks the um, immutable idea. Another question. Yeah, so MySQL and some support these features, but this is not, not covered by the standard. Any other question? Two silence there, one. How does the features and especially the JSON one affect indexing? I mean, um, basically not at all. So the way you could index, so first of all, indexing is not covered by the SQL standard because it's uh, just uh, a vehicle to make it fast. 
and how it is made by most databases, they just use the concept of function-based indexing. So you can write a function-based index which says, okay, if you have, uh, let's say, underscore ID element there, then you can basically pick that out with one, with one of these JSON parse expressions and then build an index upon that. Another question? Generated col yeah, you can use generated columns for that. Yeah, some databases require the generated columns to have function-based indexes, other can do it directly. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I say thank you again. Um,